All right. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I trust it's been a valuable day. Thanks for sticking around for the 5 p.m. session. Uh, just so we can get a sense of who's in the room and make sure we hit the mark uh, and are good stewards of your time, uh, I want to ask a couple of questions to the audience. So who here has mission-critical applications in their portfolio that you're responsible for that you would describe as monoliths, whatever that means to you? Good. 92.4% of the room. Excellent. Uh, of those, uh, who, who is considering migrating them to AWS? but has questions about may I do that? Oh, good, 78%. Excellent, excellent. Um, who here has heard of the strangler pattern, a la Dr. Martin Fowler? Okay, fewer, good. Uh, who came here because uh, you maybe want to strangle those monolithic applications and get away with it? Sweet, we're gonna teach you how to do that. Well, I'm Kenneth Jackson. Uh, I'm not a professional comedian. No one is surprised by that. Uh, I am a principal solutions architect at AWS in our global financial services group, and I'm joined by a few esteemed colleagues. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Harsha Sharma. I'm a solutions architect as well, global financial services division. Ken and I are joined by uh, Christopher Marsh Borden, who is sitting in the back waving. Um, he is a dear colleague. Uh, he's a co-member of, uh, of this team who's, who's built and designed this presentation. Uh, he's a principal solutions architect as well in the financial services division. Yeah, he was on the big screen in the keynote uh, for his work with MasterCard and was here earlier uh, in the new data presentation. So we thought he had enough screen time, so we made him sit in the back. Uh, so it's late in the day. Um, I'll give you the TLDR on the session uh, so you know where we're headed. Right? We're going to assert that as we think about migrations, many of us have probably fallen into a false dichotomy. We thought that our, that our two choices were lift and shift with minimal transformation, uh, or I've got to refactor the app. And depending on uh, the biases you come with, you, know, you may lean more toward one or the other. When you think about these monoliths, you may think, boy, the, the thought of decomposing it and re-architecting and modernizing it to get the benefits of a of a microservice architecture, it's just too much. It would take too long. And so my only real option is lift and shift. Uh, bring my whole stack and the operational procedures that go with it uh, to AWS. Others of you may be more optimistic. Say, no, no, we want to attack it, we want to pull in. But before we can really go to AWS, uh, we need to refactor it. We need to have all 12 factors. And you know, likelihood, uh, maybe you're somewhere in between, but still think that those are your two choices. Um, we're going to assert that there is a, a third way where you can get the best of the both worlds. Uh, we will actually start with lifting and shifting your appli applications, but in a data-driven way, uh, peel off pieces using this strangler pattern. So that's where we're going, and that's where we hope to spend the meat of the, the time and then uh, to leave time at the end to answer questions based on our experience and, and some of the challenges you face. Before we do that, though, we do want to level set and remind uh, what have we learned at AWS in these years of serving customers about application migrations? What resources are out there for you? What patterns are we seeing? So we'll spend a little time doing that, uh, and then we'll get to the strangler pattern. Okay? All right. So uh, this may be a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, right? It may be obvious, you know, why you want to migrate uh, applications to the cloud. But we want to include this because uh, I, I presume most people who are here at 5 o'clock on an AWS summit are technologists. And we sometimes are biased toward technology for technology's sake. And th this slide is meant to remind us that uh, the cloud is a means to business ends, not an end in and of itself. And I say that as someone who works for AWS, right, we, we feel deeply that in the fullness of time, uh, most of our customers will not operate data centers, and those that do will operate significantly smaller footprint of data centers. Um, we see our, in financial services, it's part of the FinServe track, and it's where Harsha, Christopher, and I work. Uh, you know, we see customers of all shapes and sizes, you know, traditional ones, like, like the whole trade life cycle. So NASDAQ and DTCC and FINRA, right? So uh, market making and clearing and, and surveillance of trades have said, you know, they're moving significant workloads to the cloud. Uh, we see banks like BBVA and Capital One moving core banking systems. And then we see this amazing FinTech startup ecosystem, uh, the Starlings and Simples and Stripes and Betterments of the world, uh, moving and, and being willing to talk publicly about that, right? So, so we, have, we have deep and, and very public biases about um, people moving workloads to the cloud. But we always have to check ourselves and remind us, you know, at as deep a level as we can, why are we moving this workload or that workload? And let that why inform our strategy. Some of, some of those motivations are pretty obvious, right? Uh, easily quantifiable, things like the desire to take cost out 
or a calendar date tied to some uh, merger and acquisition event or a contract for a data center lease or an outsourcing contract coming due. Uh, others are a little harder to quantify. Like uh, you may say, hey, we want to be more agile. We want to be more responsive to our customers. Uh, we want to transform our business. And so the challenge here for all of us technologists in the room is admit our biases toward the, the new and the modern, uh, our biases toward uh, technology, maybe for technology's sake, and try to, as deep a level, understand the why for our internal and external customers. Why are we considering migrating this workload? And let that inform our choice of patterns. Further, we want to quantify that. So the, six, or the, the five bullet points there in orange come from the AWS Migration White Paper. Who here is familiar with and has read the AWS Migration White Paper? OK, a very small number. Um, I would commend it. Some of the material here has come from that. Uh, it's easily findable. It's linked in the resources section. Uh, but as, as we've worked with many customers to migrate workloads, we see you know, these, these five in orange are key metrics to measure, right? to, to get as detailed as you can on your baseline for things like what's the uh, cost to operate the application today? Um, where and how big are the spikes for hardware refreshes and software refreshes and upgrades and things that I might be able to avoid? Um, uh, what kind of resilience do I have today? What, what are my real uh, availability numbers? Uh, uh, what, what's my mean time between failure and my application? And, and how might moving to the cloud uh, affect that, depending on which migration pattern I pick? But then back to those that are a little harder to quantify, or maybe you aren't quantifying today. Uh, it's a worthwhile exercise when you're thinking about migrating to AWS. Say, okay, what, what is my real workforce productivity today? And that, that may be in terms of uh, you know, lines of code, uh, maybe in terms of uh, other, other metrics about your development or operations staff. And then how, where do I expect, what's my hypothesis about how I'm going to positively influence those as I move to the cloud? Um, similarly for, for my agility, and it's a, a term maybe uh, tough to define, but, but if, you can, if you can get some metrics on what's the mean time between uh, recognizing a market opportunity or getting feedback from customers and getting that capability into the market. Um, and then, again, let that choose. Like, uh, is going faster going to be more important than taking my time because I'm, I'm optimizing on one or more of these metrics? But we're adding a sixth that's not mentioned in the white paper, which is what is the opportunity cost of the time it's going to take for me to get the workload to the cloud? Right? And we'll see that in multiple uh, patterns, you know, they, they, they vary on that uh, axis. But when we were talking about monoliths, you guys raised your hand, said some of you have monoliths. What is a monolith? Um, there's no textbook definition, uh, but I think we think of it as something that's sufficiently large uh, in terms of lines of code uh, that is moved as a single deployable unit. Uh, monoliths, you know, it, it kind of is a pejorative term. Uh, you, you know, gets a bad rap, but there are some benefits, right? Like, you can generally load the whole thing in, a, in an IDE, right? It might be a, a thing that's compiled to a big jar file. Uh, you can step through it and debug it. Uh, it's simple at some level to deploy, right? It all goes uh, in one unit. Again, big jar file or a set of file hier hierarchies. Um, but, but they do have some challenges. Um, first, uh, the, the largeness. Th this data comes to us from CAS software, who periodically uh, publishes research based on the applications that are submitted to them uh, for analysis. And this is from their specific report on financial services. We're in the FinServe track. I know some of you may or may not be in the industry, uh, but it's the one that we serve. Um, incidentally, they do have another uh, report that's multi-industry, and the shape of the graph is nearly identical. But uh, this is in the FinServe family. You know, we see that, that more than half of the applications have uh, more than 100,000 lines of code. And then out toward the end, you know, nearly 10% are larger than 1 million uh, lines of code, again, in a single deployable unit. And the way we see this happening, I won't ask for a show of hands here, but, and I probably can't even see any head nodding with the bright lights, uh, but you know, think about this, uh, something large like an online banking application, uh, typical three-tier application. You maybe do three releases a year, so you have four months worth of, of backlog and features, and then the release event, in many cases, some of the customers I've worked with is uh, it's, a, it's a weekend, we're going to pull a lot of overtime, we're going to order a lot of pizza, there'll be a lot of people in the room, um, a lot of status calls and meetings, and when it goes well, there's an email sent out the next day thanking a long list of people for all their Herculean efforts uh, to get that release out, and then totaling up the millions of lines of code that were changed and the millions of uh, person hours involved in the release. Um, and that's when it goes well, right? When it goes poorly, uh, unwinding it can 
be a challenge, right? So that's what we mean by a monolith, uh, but these tend to be important applications. There's a reason they have hundreds of thousands or even uh, north of a million lines of code, right? This is something meaningful and important to your business, uh, but also, uh, you know, for some of the reasons I alluded to, uh, have uh, motivation to start to decomposing it, start to be able to reorganize teams, not in terms of UI and business logic and DBAs, uh, but to organize teams around functions so that those functions can evolve uh, independently. So we've looked at, we've looked at drivers, we've looked at um, what quantifies as a monolith. Um, going back to the migration white paper that Ken called out, um, we've harvested information by directly working with customers. Uh, this, this infographic also comes from there. Uh, we've harvested information um, um, directly working with customers as to what strategies or what, what um, migration strategies have they adopted or have they looked at when they're migrating the applications to the cloud. Uh, we're going to in detail talk about the top blue line, which is rehost, which is lift and shift, uh, and the bottom blue line, which is re-architect, which is basically a rewrite of the entire application in detail in the next couple of slides. But, but to give you an overall idea of, of what this is representing, um, on the left, the first two steps remain consistent. Like, again, this is first-hand information of, of our professional services division looking at uh, customer migrations and helping them and assisting them and executing them. Uh, the first two steps is basically you discover, right? You discover what are your applications, what portfolio you have. You assess them. You, you prioritize them. Uh, then you determine a migration path, depending on what exactly consists of the uh, portfolio itself. Uh, but then you can go into different directions. Um, you can do lift and shift. Uh, you could do the yellow line, which is basically lift, tinker, and shift, which is you don't change anything in your monolith. You just have, uh, you re-platform, you make changes to the actual underlying mm -hmm. platform. You're running a, a middleware, a commercial middleware product, and you want to change to an open source product like Tomcat. Um, um, that, that constitutes as a certain strategy by itself because um, it, uh, why not, right? Save, save on the licenses costs. Um, repurchase is slightly similar, the orange line that is. Uh, it, it actually is basically saying that if you have like a commercial off-the-shelf uh, software, you, you move to a SaaS product on the cloud. Um, uh, that, again, is another strategy that customers have adopted. Um, but don't discount the two gray lines on the left, right, which, which um, is, is actually very meaningful uh, decision-making, depending on, on what application you're looking at, which basically is that, hey, I have uh, looked at this app. This is great. There's no real business push for me to move this right away. Uh, it probably is better off if I just re revisit it later uh, or uh, put it in that list of, of, of it being retired eventually at some point, right? So, so these are the six R's at a very high level. Um, on the rightmost extreme, you will see that validation, transition, and productionizing it remain consistent again. Uh, what we are proposing as a part of this talk is a, a very happy balance between the top blue line and the bottom blue line, which is rehost and rearchitect. So let's let's look at those. With rehost, you basically are doing lift and shift. The actual work that you have is the top uh, the the two blue boxes that you see, which is um, automating uh, the actual move itself and and mi using migration tools in the process. Uh, that is the real work that is involved. That is slightly different from what you would do on another uh, 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 strategy itself. Um, again, we recommend using automation tools like database migration service or server migration service, using something like a Cloud Endure to assist in your migration. But you basically are just lifting the app, not changing anything at all, and just moving it to the cloud and running it in the same environment. Uh, what does that mean to the actual drivers? Uh, how, does it, how does it, from a benefits perspective, impact your drivers? Um, from an operational cost perspective or even cost avoidance, both of them are low, uh, as, as you could imagine, right? Uh, you haven't changed anything. Everything remains the same. Um, um, all, all, I do want to caveat and say that GE oil and gas saved uh, about more than 30% or 30% uh, in savings by just moving to the cloud, not changing anything. Uh, and so there are inherent benefits of actually moving. Um, and, and, and that doesn't mean you're doing anything meaningful to the actual application. Um, workforce productivity wise, nothing has changed. You still have the same tools, you still have the same processes. You've probably not done SDLC um, around your application deployment process, uh, which means that you, your users, you're still doing undifferentiated heavy lifting. 
Um, from a resiliency perspective, you probably benefited by moving to AWS by itself, which means that you've deployed your monolith across two AZs, um, increased your resiliency posture. Uh, going back to G oil and gas again, uh, uh, they actually saw a reduction in their P0 and P1 incidents by more than 90%. So, so there are inherent benefits of just doing it, which is why we've marked it as medium. Um, from an agility perspective, again, now you haven't built anything around what was there on-prem. Uh, so you pretty much have um, the same processes and, 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 and uh, are not tapping into the actual cloud nativeness uh, and the benefits of it. Therefore, marked low. But the real driver, the real benefit is that you've given your monolith or your application a new lease of life, you, which is why time to value is high. Um, um, for, for scenarios like data center consolidation, uh, it, it, it kind of, you now don't have to renew your lease anymore. You, don't, you just move your application, you've moved it quickly, um, and, and you've just given yourself another chance uh, with that app itself. On the flip side, um, re-architecture is completely the other extreme, right? You're, you're, you have a lot of groundwork uh, uh, to do, even before you write a single line of code. You have to assess the situation, you have to assess the platform that you'll run in, uh, you, you redesign the entire thing, you have to first figure out if you have the appropriate skill sets in-house to do that. Uh, uh, so even, there's a lot of groundwork that happens, um, and, and once you begin, you finish that, and you start writing code, you, you build an SDLC processor uh, around it, integrate it, productionize it, um, and, and therefore, from an access perspective, from a metrics perspective, everything gets flipped. Um, your, your costs, gains, um, uh, benefits are higher because you've now designed for cloud nativeness. Your, your cost avoidance is also, the benefit itself is reaped, that is reaped is higher. Uh, your workforce productivity is higher again, which is because you've now uh, built the appropriate processes around your current application portfolio, which means that uh, they're doing things that are more um, aligned to the business rather than doing mundane tasks or doing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, resiliency posture again improves because, say, you've now not deployed across AZs but across regions because that makes more sense for the app. Uh, and agility, of, of course, uh, is, is much higher as well because now you have a proper SGLC deployment pipeline, you've, you've rebuilt it appropriately, right? So, so there are obviously inherent benefits of re-architecting, right? But, but then on, on the time to value axis, you lose out because the amount of time and money you've spent up front is, is painful. Um, and, and the reason why we are talking in detail about uh, the rehost and the re-architecture uh, uh, portions of it is because we're looking at things uh, where we could somehow save on and, and use the benefits of both these options and, and propose a new pattern itself. Yeah, so just to summarize before we talk about Strangler, right, if, if you look at our two patterns that are bolded there, rehost and rearchitecture, right, the, the, the trade-off, just as Harsh has said, is uh, time and then the value you get from optimization, right? Much faster to uh, rehost, to, to lift and shift, uh, but your opportunity to optimize and take advantage of the cloud uh, is lower. But I will point out, you know, the, the metrics that, that are cited in the migration white paper and elsewhere that uh, simply by moving, you know, don't discount rehost, right? It might be the right strategy uh, for your application, at least for a time. Uh, and if other customers' experience is a good indication, uh, you pick up some cost benefits. Again, just think about being able to right size the hardware, like to run a number of experiments and and pick the right hardware. That, that's a reasonably hard thing to do uh, and with traditional hosting, so, so pick up some cost benefits and then pick up some resiliency benefits simply by running on the AWS global infrastructure. But we really wanna talk about um, a new way. So, so as I mentioned uh, before, this Strangler pattern was first coined, I think about 2004 by Martin Fowler, who's a computer scientist. And despite my poor jokes at the beginning, it actually comes from the world of botany, not from the world of uh, homicide. So hopefully that doesn't disappoint anyone. Um, but he observed uh, these uh, strangler figs. Uh, they, they grow around the world. He saw them in New Zealand, and they grow on a tree. So you imagine the seed gets deposited, the vines start growing down and, and competing with the tree for nutrients, and they grow up to the canopy to get uh, light. But over time, what happens is they win that battle, and they, 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 they strangle the tree and derive all the nutrients. The tree eventually dies and rots, and so what you're left with is a tree-shaped uh, thing that's actually uh, a set of distinct 
of vines and organisms. And not to press the metaphor too far, but Dr. Fowler said, that's what we want to do our system, right? The, the system is the tree. Uh, it's a monolithic thing, a, a, a single system. But we're going to start peeling things off of it, uh, and eventually we'll have this set of uh, threads, these set of vines that will look like a tree, but are fundamentally something different. And that will happen slowly uh, over time. So there you go. Now you know where the uh, metaphor came from. So how do we do it? Uh, and we're going to consider in our example, um, let's say a, like a two-tier, could be a three-tier uh, online banking application, right? I've got some set of web and business logic hosted in, as Harsha said, it could be a commercial uh, runtime, it could be uh, an open source runtime. Um, in our case, we have a relational database, right? Because the time this thing was built, that was really the only durable store we had. So we made it do all kinds of things, even if it wasn't necessarily the best data store for it, at least not uh, with the choices we have for modern architectures. So that's our mental model. Uh, hopefully that matches uh, the monoliths that, that you have. Uh, incidentally, there's in our resources section, uh, we link to a, a talk by Vanguard that they did at reInvent uh, 2017. Where they talk about mainframe uh, applications, right? So this doesn't have to be already in the distributed world. Uh, these techniques could apply, but some subtleties, obviously, if you're moving from uh, a mainframe platform to distributed. But anyway, so the, and our model is a distributed app, uh, end tier, relational backend. And step one is to rehost. So, so right off the bat, uh, you pick up those benefits uh, for cost and resiliency just by rehosting. Now, if, you're, if your eyesight is pretty keen, uh, you'll see that um, we're, we're fudging a little bit, right? So that blue line, rehost, not changing any stack. Well, we have been a, a opportunistic about changing some components out, right? So uh, let's say we had a commercial database before, and now we've switched to RDS. And not required, but just to get you thinking that, hey, just because I'm lifting and shifting doesn't mean I don't touch anything. But we've essentially, um, we haven't touched any of the code in our monolith. Uh, we have split the front and middle tier across availability zones. We've put that behind an application load balancer, put those in an auto-scaling group. Uh, but all of those instances write to a, a single master, but we have, we're doing synchronous commits across AZs uh, to an RDS standby. And, and in our case, we've picked up the uh, availability benefits of RDS, but you could, you could build the same sort of architecture even if you're running your database engine on EC2 instances that you still manage. Right? So step one, uh, rehost and pick up those benefits right away. But that then allows us you know, to, to uh, not have to touch the monolith, right? It's still there, right? It, it, hasn't, it hasn't changed, right? The, the code paths uh, still work uh, as is. Great. Step two, then, is to put uh, API Gateway in front of this. And you might be thinking, well, wait, wait, wait. Like, I know about API Gateway, right? This is the managed service that allows me to build RESTful APIs and solve challenges of uh, throttling and metering and billing um, and security and management. All true, uh, that's what API Gateway is designed for. But API Gateway also includes native integration to gather metrics on our, app, on our API calls. And that's the point we want to use for our uh, Strangler migration strategy. We want to be data-driven in our decisions about which pieces of the application to pull off. And API Gateway, in addition to the benefits uh, that I just mentioned when you're building public-facing APIs uh, also gives us uh, metrics. So um, how might I do that? Uh, I would go in and configure it uh, really in pass-through mode. So in API Gateway terminology, it's set up as a proxy, uh, and really it's just going to forward those requests through. It's not doing a lot of intelligent routing. It's not adding value to that, that decision about where it lands in my code path, uh, but I am going to start to pick up uh, some data. Once I've done that, right, I mean, that, that data is going, there are a couple of places out of the box you get with API Gateway. One is CloudWatch metrics. So you pick up a couple in, in our scenario that are important. So you get a count metric, how many times was this particular API called, and you get a metric called latency, which really, because it's a synchronous call, uh, is, is uh, call time, right? What was, the, what was the time between when it hit the API Gateway front door till the back-end application serviced it and it came back? But with that data, uh, I can start to see, you know, where, where are my hotspots in terms of number of calls uh, and the duration of those calls. And I can use that data to uh, inform my decisions. We do know that this is uh, a bit of a simplistic example for the sake of the presentation, right? We're talking about finding a read hotspot 
uh, with data. So in something like online banking, you know, this might be check balance, right? It, it's called all the time where things like, you know, parts of the budgeting system in the online banking application or, um, you know, looking at my mortgage history might be called more infrequently. Um, but, you know, this would, this would be true also for um, paths that did a write, right? That were very write intensive. You, you'd pick up the metrics uh, as well. So um, if we want to talk about more sophisticated scenarios, we can do that uh, in the Q&A. But hopefully with us so far. So we've, we've taken our monolith, we've lifted and shifted it, we've gotten some immediate benefit. Maybe we've opportunistically uh, moved to some managed services like RDS. Uh, we've picked up resiliency from simply putting it behind a load balancer and distributing our middle tiers among availability zones and, and maybe even picked up some resiliency at the database tier level, whether we're managing it or, or you're managing it. Uh, by being able to do synchronous commits with fault isolation across availability zones. And now we're starting to get data um, in the terms of CloudWatch, uh, as we'll see in a moment, um, uh, X-Ray. Um, we're starting to get some data about, uh, you know, wh where are my hotspots? So in addition to CloudWatch, uh, API Gateway is natively integrated with X-Ray. Who are anyone familiar with X-Ray has played with it? Cool. Um, some. If you haven't, it's well worth it. So without instrumenting your code, you sort of get call trace data here just because it's being uh, coming through API Gateway. So I can see um, at a detailed level, in our case, that out of 197 transactions per second, 196 are going down one particular call path. So there's my check balance API. But if you want to go further, you know, now that you're using X-Ray and you do want to, let's say you have a legacy Java application, you want to pick up the Java SDK for X-Ray, uh, add some instrumentation, you know, some declarative style instrumentation to your code. Now I can start getting that distributed call tracing, not just at the front door, um, you know, at the HTTP API, but all the way through, right? Um, so with a single click box or a single API call, you can enable X-Ray integration and API gateway, start getting uh, call data um, and visualizations like we're showing here. Um, but also, um, if you go a step further and you want to instrument your monolith code, you can get uh, much more detailed call tracing metrics and you can make much more informed data-driven decisions about where to spend uh, your time in peeling things off uh, to go uh, away from the monolith using the strangler pattern. So you have the appropriate observability now. You have recognized what would be a good fit or what would be a good functionality to move out of the monolith. Uh, you, as radical as this may sound, uh, you, you build a Lambda function. You build a Lambda function and you build uh, a, a, an appropriate database that, that, that fits the specific use case. Uh, and again, uh, Lambda and Dynamo are interchangeable to, when I say interchangeable, I mean uh, replaceable with the appropriate compute and the database family uh, as to what exactly fits your use case. The point being that you have the choice, you have the freedom because you are going to write a functionality and uh, you're going to recreate a functionality outside of the monolith without touching your monolith uh, because that would require you to find the developer who wrote it, which might not be possible. Uh, and and you, you, you create the functionality outside of the monolith uh, uh, in a Lambda function in this case, um, and, and you create a DynamoDB, which actually has a key, which is our key value pair database, and, and you have uh, the appropriate data uh, to support that functionality. Uh, for you to move data from your monolith to support uh, that specific functionality, you could use something like a database migration service, which is uh, an AWS service that helps um, migrating uh, both from on-prem and from one database system to another, it supports homogeneous and heterogeneous migrations. Um, and you could use uh, that service to convert your relational database to something like a Dynamo, which is a key value pair NoSQL database, right? Um, and, and to keep data in sync, uh, something like a database migration service supports CDC, which is change data capture, which, which constantly keeps uh, data in sync from the monolith to, to the Dynamo DB table. Um, just want to point out again that Lambda function could be EC2, uh, Dynamo could be Aurora, MySQL, your own product. Um, the point is that you build something that's outside of it, independent of the monolith. Do not worry about the actual code that sits in the monolith. Just look at the actual business functionality that you're trying to recreate and build it outside of the system. How do you use that then? You've, you've built the hotspot outside of the system and you use something like a canary release on API Gateway, which completely de-risks your entire my, your, my, your, um, uh, your functionality in the sense there's an option called uh, canary releases on API Gateway, which lets you send a certain percentage of your traffic to your new system. And 
This doesn't mean you do it, do it in production um, on, on day one. You, you probably will go through dev, QA, pre-prod, prod. The point is that you would use Canadian releases in production to de-risk your production deployment so that you can actually use X-Ray and CloudWatch to see how those 10% of the calls are performing. This percentage can be whatever you want to. It can be four, five. The idea is you have control. And you can programmatically or via the UI, uh, which is how it would look uh, on the UI, you can increase the percentage. So what, what we've done here is, in this dummy example, I've created check balance um, uh, as, a, as a new API call, as a new resource, it is a get. Uh, the proxy remains as such as, if you remember, we, we showed you in the previous screenshot. Um, and we create a canary, which is, we say that 10% of the traffic would go to the new resource. And we pointed to the Lambda backend, uh, which is shown on the third screenshot on the right. Um, what, what this does again is that via X-Ray, via native integration of X-Ray, you can actually track canary working real time. You can see out of every 101 requests in this uh, simplified example, 11 are going to the Lambda backend and 90 go back to the monolith. Um, and slowly, you can actually use this to um, iteratively strangulate and increase the percentages so that the monolith calls completely go down to zero. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, which, which one of Ogles, uh rightly called out on his blog, and even today during his keynote, uh, is, is that one database doesn't fit all use cases anymore. Um, uh, you, there is this, we have this family of purpose-filled databases, and all of you, you, depending on the use case that you're trying to solve, you pick the database that you need, and you create a polyglot. Uh, why, am I, why am I pointing this out is, is because uh, we have this entire family of, of purpose-built databases uh, which satisfy your use cases, right, from relational to key value, which in this example we're using in DynamoDB, um, uh, to search functionality. If, if, you, if you decide that you want, in your online banking, you want customers to, to be able to search for their statements or something, you can, you can use something like Elasticsearch to, to fuel that. Um, and, and again, there's a wide array of features uh, that these databases can, can satisfy. I uh, would like to point out that it doesn't mean that we don't have commercial database engines. Uh, relational databases have Oracle and SQL Server, and we've all, we also have our own purpose-built database um, in, uh, engine in uh, Amazon Aurora. With, with that arsenal that you have with the platform of AWS, you start to iteratively strangulate. You start to shrink your monolith by not touching the monolith code itself, but slowly build systems and build things out of the monolith. Um, an application team or an application two pizza team can come and tell you, hey, we, the business owner or the business entity of this specific use case or this specific functionality, um, we, would, we, we don't want a radical change from EC2 to Lambda. We actually want to continue running on EC2 because we need GPUs. Um, uh, we, we, need, we need something that is so specific to EC2 that we, we want that, right? And, and that's completely okay. The point is you get to a state where you have the option to have heterogeneous systems, right? So, so you could do ELB and EC2, and you can have an Amazon Aurora because that fits your use case. Um, you can, again, use database migration service, or you could use triggers, depending on what database engine you're running on today, to migrate data off from the old system. And eventually, uh, this might take years, depending on how complicated the monolith is, uh, you would have created uh, a, a parallel system of the same functionality. The monolith actually is still there. It's just that no real calls are going to it. We have not touched anything. We have, you, you don't have to scale the monolith in, in at all. You probably just have one instance running in an auto-scaling group because there's no traffic going to it anymore. No, not meaningful anymore. Uh, and if the new features and the systems that you're building actually have to, have to speak to each other, depending on what you have in your compute layer, uh, if you have something like a Lambda, Farget, and EC2, all wanting to talk to each other, you could use something like an API gateway inside your VPC so that they can speak to each other, or if you're running a fully fueled uh, container instances uh, uh, in Fargate or ECS, you could use something like a service mesh, which, which we have uh, in the form of app mesh. So, so what I want to do, what I want to uh, point out before I hand out uh, the, the ticker to Ken is, is that you have freedom. Uh, you have freedom using something like a strangler pattern where you have a facade in front to build systems in parallel behind it without impacting your customers. Cool. 
Yeah. So, so where have we come? Right. So we asserted at the beginning uh, that there was a middle ground that you could start to incrementally realize the values of optimization uh, without uh, having to take that all on at once. Right. And, and the, this false dichotomy that maybe some of us uh, have fallen into of rehost or uh, complete refactor. You may not be our only options. Again, th those may be legitimate. There, there may be factors where you, like, really, we really do have to um, completely refactor this application. But I encourage you uh, to consider whether you could attack it this way uh, using some of the techniques uh, we have described. I mean, just to, to, to reiterate uh, some of the points that Harsha made, right? Uh, this is about uh, choice, right? It's about choice at each, at each layer. Um, which, which compute paradigm programming stack um, and, and tooling you know, ecosystem makes sense for that team. You know, how can I take, you know, some of the challenges with the monolith is that the teams tend to be organized for, you know, I have front end developers, I have middle tier you know, specialists and, and developers right, who, who write Java and understand how to do that. Um, and then I have DBAs, right? But um, ownership for functionality can be a real challenge, right? And, and so coordinating these releases um, you know, it gets burdensome. That's why we, we only do them so often, and it's, it requires a lot of manpower. Um, the promise of uh, more modern architectures, call it microservices or what you will, is that no, I can, I can have teams that move at the appropriate speed using the appropriate technology stack to solve that problem, right? I'm not trying to implement full tech searching for my banking, for, for my bank transactions using a relational database with some sort of string manipulation functions that I might have. Uh, in SQL, right? I can use a proper modern uh, search engine because that's appropriate for that use case. Um, how can I get to that sort of agility uh, by restructuring the team? And we're, we're asserting that the strangler pattern uh, and hopefully some of these techniques are a way uh, to get there incrementally. Um, and last pitch too is don't discount rehost. Sometimes it gets a bad name. Uh, there are many uh, who, who say that no, you really can't go to the cloud until you're cloud native, whatever that means for you but it usually means I have to do a lot of refactoring work before I can go to the cloud. In our experience, that's not really true. You get some benefit right over the bat, and then it gives you a platform to start doing some of this iterative strangulation that we've talked about today. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, we have plugged the AWS migration white paper. Uh, it's a great resource. A couple of other talks where we talk about this, including one specifically about mainframes, right? Like, if you're, if there may be steps that we didn't talk about here, like, which, oh, I've got to get from the mainframe thing to the distributed thing, or maybe I've got to get from, you know, my APIs aren't HTTP based, so I can't, you know, use API Gateway for metrics, right? Like, there may be some interim steps, and those sessions uh, give you some real world examples. Um, and even one, um, the, the two in the middle are AWS talks. Uh, I'm a really big fan of the last talk, which was done by Pivotal at their user conference a few years ago, uh, where they, they talk about a code base. They, they, they didn't really understand. You know, the developers had, had long gone, and they didn't even know whether the code really ac accurately uh, reflected the true business rules. And so they ran in parallel and actually used the, the they would compare the data coming out of both code paths uh, to assess the accuracy of, of changes and things. So, so a pretty fascinating talk there um, by uh, two engineers from Pivotal. Uh, if you miss them, I know it's, it's too late to go see them now because we're in the last slot, but uh, these should be on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. Um, two more sessions on application migration. Um, one more general overview of, of our experiences in helping customers migrate. Uh, the middle one specifically talking about database migration uh, and, and some of the tools like DMS uh, that you can use. And then Christopher's session earlier which really doesn't have to do with application migration, but it was a really fascinating talk, and uh, he's our colleague, but uh, how new data, which is a subsidiary of MasterCard, is using machine learning to detect fraud. So if you missed that one, uh, definitely go back and watch. So with that, though, we do have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions, and Christopher's gonna come up. Um, so yeah, what did we not talk about that you wanna hear about? What specific challenges have you had migrating monoliths? Um, let's go. Okay, we're gonna switch to this. So I have to turn this off, okay? Or you have to turn it off? All right, cool. Uh, so, questions. Oh, come on. Oh, all right. Oh, sorry, I, I saw him first. <laughs> yeah, what you got? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, while we start doing that pattern, I mean, as I understand that we want to start creating a separate database and start putting a sync from your old database to new. So I just want to know, like, 
how the other way around it's going to happen because the thinking has to be both way around because things which will be written in the new system has to be gone back to the old. Yeah. So the question, well, you guys can hear the question, right? So um, writes are definitely more challenging than reads, right? Like we can have read replicas. We, we could sync to uh, a new data store, like say a, uh, something tuned for writes, like a, a NoSQL database, right? We can sync. And everybody understands, yeah, that's pretty simple. Uh, the challenge is write. So our recommendation is ideally when you think about uh, the domain um, for a given uh, functionality, um, ideally uh, move out you know, that slice of the monolith where all the rights for that particular uh, domain are, are handled by uh, that new slice. But we know that that's not always true and that's where you might use techniques like Harsha was describing um, to, to keep the two in sync. Right? I don't know if you want to elaborate on that anymore. Sure. So uh, just to kind of go back on the, the reason why you, you use data to find the hotspots is so that you, know, you, can, you can locate the places where you've got the most scalability at that point in time or where you need to scale the most. Because when you're trying to scale a monolith, even in the cloud, you're having to scale the entire piece over and over again. So by using the ability to focus on the hotspots, which generally, and I'm going I'm to be bias, it's going to be a reads more than your writes. For the vast majority of applications, there may be some differences. So in the pattern that we showed with the data, all we're doing is the writes continue to be directed back down to the monolith because they're less frequent than the reads. When that happens, obviously Trigger or the database migration service is moving that data across to the reads. There's obviously there's a little bit of latency involved there, by and large, but there are strategies. We showed the very simplest strategy, which is literally, you know, right back to the old data, get it migrated across to the new. But you can, act, you can take different tactics. Uh, so you can do what I could call an inverse Y, where you're writing to a centralized place like a queue, and the writes go in two directions. Right? And we're actually working on some further concepts around that to actually provide more context, because data certainly is a big consideration in this. But for that purposes, that was a very, very simplistic, sorry, mic on the mic, uh, scenario where we just allowed the writes to continue to go back to the monolith until such time as they could be migrated across to lambdas or you know, microservices and containers, et cetera. I think we had one in the middle. Yep. OK. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't seen the database migration service, uh, you should. Like uh, the latest numbers I saw is um, 130,000 or more databases have been migrated, and it's 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 many to many, and it's bi-directional, right? And it's also not a one-time. Like it can keep running, and that's why Harsha described it as in in a, in a CDC um, type scenario. So short answer is yes, right? Like you can go from um, from many to many, and even relational to non-relational. So if you haven't seen Database Migration Service, and there's a tool underneath it called the Schema Conversion Tool, take a look at it. Um, it can not only migrate schemas and data, but migrate stored procs and, and other things. So super powerful, managed um, database migration and CDC uh, tool. Um, so yeah. It, it, Yeah, you can run it in, in sort of report mode, and you'll get a, a red, amber, green about, hey, this is very highly likely to work. This is, you know, maybe going to be a little more challenging, and this, um, you have some, you're going to have to do some custom work. Um, so, you, so you run that several times. Obviously, you, you, you test it, and you make sure before you do a cutover, and then it, you, you can actually keep running it, right? Like, so you can run two systems in parallel um, and, and have it doing, um, you know, migrating only changes uh, you know, at, before you do a cutover. So, so you don't have to do a, a big bang over the weekend kind of thing. We, we actually, you know, don't really like those. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, so we're recording. Oh, sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, so our monolith does a lot of batch processing too. So I'm wondering, I'm trying to think about like how the strangler pattern might apply for batch processing, and I'm wondering if um, there might be additional patterns or other white papers or references that you might have to share related to batch processing. Yeah, so this actually is 
primarily for a REST-based application that we considered. Uh, for badge, do we have documentation? Well, Vengar talked about that. Um, so, so at the database layer, right, so you, again, so depending on what your system does, if there's a data, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, batch processing that happens on-prem and there's data stored and you want to actually cut it over to, to the cloud, uh, again, it, it comes back to the, the, the process of moving it to uh, an, uh, uh, an integration layer, uh, which actually takes that data in and then moves it to the appropriate cloud system. But is there a way where you can do canary releases for batch processes? If, you know what I mean? Like, so it, it, API Gateway is designed to handle REST calls. Uh, it's, it's not a, a backend batch processing fronting system, right? So. Yeah, no, no, I mean, so one of the factors here is, 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 is around scalability. Um, so if you need scalability within the batch process itself, there may be an opportunity there. Is there a pattern that we can describe here? We haven't got it, I'll be honest at this point. But it doesn't necessarily lend itself to what we're trying to achieve. You want to keep it. And you know, we showed at the end the big bang and the implosion uh, where the, the, the monolith goes away. That doesn't actually never actually have to happen. There, there, there should be processes that you should keep running in the monolith if there's no real urgency or requirement to actually shift them across. Um, batch processes don't tend to be you know, multi-hosted, uh, et cetera. You can just run them, they, they go for a window of time, et cetera. But there may be services that they call that you could do and move those pieces across to the lambdas or to something else uh, to reduce down the time it takes to process. So it's like decom decomposing that application further. Um, but it's a good point. It's something we should actually consider. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll, give, I'll give it to you in a second. So uh, the point I was trying to make was uh, is, is if, if you actually are doing batch processing and you, can't, you, you don't have anything fronting it, right? there's no way you can break it out because, because it's working in the background. It's probably just talking to itself, processing some data. But if there is any calls that is coming to the system or going out of the system, again, we can talk offline um, as to what the current monolith does. Uh, there's a way you can break it, be it a load balancer, be it an API gateway, anything that can facade it because that's the first hit of any request that comes in. Could be a network load balancer, anything, right? So, so once you have a facade, then you can, or at least the application supports a facade, then you can definitely move it to the cloud, build something in front of it, break it out from there, and do something like a strangler. But I think what would ideally fit your use case from what I've heard so far is maybe a re-architect or a re-host blindly because, because, because of the way the application is designed in, in itself. Oh, no, no, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would just look at the Vanguard session because they were moving a mainframe app, a lot of batch processing, and they talked about how they attacked that, right? Like if, you, if you're not, if you're struggling to complete within your batch window, you know, just, just the sheer fact of being able to go wide and do things in parallel because um, you're not infrastructure constrained, you know, I don't, I don't know what particular challenges you have. Um, yeah, so maybe we can chat more later. <laughs> okay. Oh, I don't want to starve this side of the room. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so uh, talking of batch processing a bit further, so um, I think the migration strategies mostly around the database uh, are, are the ultimate persistence layer. Uh, but in, in, in a real life, uh, you have a lot of processing happening before that in terms of a file system or uh, even uh, the messaging layers in between, right, which are mm -hmm. part and parcel of a monolithic application. So are there any I, I can understand it might not be a pure lift and shift, but are there any guidelines for that kind of a migration so, before you can really do a complete lift and shift into? Yeah, I want to make sure I understand the question, uh, and then I'll. But so, uh, in our example, right, we had a single relational database. In the real world, right, your, your data stores might be more diverse, right? Uh, you might have a relational database, might have flat files that are moving around, and, and other things. Um, I mean, I'll defer to these guys uh, or ask for their comment, but I say, yeah, when you think lift and shift, right, you, you move it all. We, we try to give you all the services you need uh, in AWS, right? So if it's a distributed file system or relational databases or, you know, anything that you might uh, be able to run on EC2. So, you know, imagine all of that is now moved and I've got the whole monolithic ecosystem there. Um, as far as guidelines, yeah, I think the, the guidelines are... And if you read more about Strangler pattern, you'll see this notion of bounded context, right? Like, so start um, thinking about the application in terms of, you know, the, the the domains or the things, and you know, which which things go together. And and ideally, I can 
they can group them so that uh, especially the rights uh, are, are in one bounded context and that's a thing I can start thinking about optimizing in terms of what's the right compute stack for this, you know, bash interactive or otherwise. Um, what's the tooling on that compute stack, programming languages and other things. Um, and then what's the right uh, data store for it, right? Again, informed by hotspots or, or, or uh, areas where I'm under the most pressure to change faster to res respond to customer demand. So you're taking all these inputs, deciding how to sequence your work with the limited development team you have. Um, but I, I would think that everything we said is, if I've had multiple stores, right, if I had files and databases and who knows what else, it, it still applies. Um, you just uh, have a little more complicated uh, diagram. But the, but the, the, the key innovation in Strangler is, we didn't talk a whole lot about, is this notion of bounded context, right? Like what, what are the, um, in, in my online banking application, right, maybe a, accounts and the operations on accounts are all one, uh, but then bill pay is another or uh, budgeting is another, but how do I carve those out and what are their dependencies from a compute and storage layer and then how can I start thinking about um, peeling those off so they can scale independently and the team can go independently. So does that help? I don't know, feels a little, uh, a little generic. <laughs> I hate that. You, anything to add? You, yeah, I mean, real world advice you've used yeah, I mean, certainly if you're going to start refactoring monoliths and big, big applications, or, you know, decoupling some of the, 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 the persistence layer is, is useful. The problem being is, is that you're, you're trying to sort of unpick a ball of, you know, a ball of yarn and it's very difficult to understand, you pull this piece here, is everything else going to fall down? The concept we're trying to show here is, is that when you address this using the strangler pattern, you're not actually changing the underlying system that you're trying to migrate away from. Um, so to Ken's point, and I think you did hit upon it, is, is that you've got to think in those, in those bounded context domain areas, but you may want to start decoupling some of the flows by using things like Kafka or Kinesis to help stream the data, you know, queuing, et cetera, to make sure that you're hitting the right places. In fact, one of the patterns we're looking at for the data piece is to actually use queuing so that when you know, the, effectively the, the two databases are consumers of that queue, they can both pull that information from. But I would very much not try and retrofit queuing into a monolith because I think that path leads down a very dangerous uh, way to go. Um, but it would be good to understand the situation in, in detail to give you the, the best advice in that respect. All right? Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, nope. yeah. And then we'll come back over here. Yeah. <laughs> we have time. Yeah, uh, regarding batch applications again, uh, so most of the time the application runs uh, 24 hours and, and the resources are not used all the time, but there at some part, I mean, it diff depends on different regions that the, the resource utilization is peaked at a certain point of time. So considering that situation, uh, the first option, lift and shift, uh, I mean, <clears throat> so you're running the whole application in the cloud, uh, though you may not be efficiently using the resources. So even in those cases, do we uh, find uh, I mean, 30 percent gain. That that's what I well, I mean, you will uh, to a degree, um, but then say something like using like you know containerization, where if you know there's a window of opportunity when the application is going to run, say 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. in the morning, don't run the EC2 instance or don't run the container for the periods when you're not using it in that respect. So you've got some time and margin. Yeah, you get. Yeah, just just to add to that, right? If if you're doing a blind lift and shift, um, and and you run on EC2 instead of containers. Um, you could use something like an EC2 fleet API, and, and um, I don't know if you've looked at it before, but, but basically what that does is it gives you an assortment of, like you, you configure a file and you say that these are the preferred instance types I want, these are the number of them that I want, this is the AMI I want to use, and, and hit a but it hit an API and it'll, it'll deploy all of them in that assortment. What this gives you is that you don't have to run any of these instances, otherwise they just come up, they do the batch processing, they die, and that's it. Right, so, so your probable your probable benefit would probably be much higher than thirty percent uh, in that scenario because a you're not procuring anything. Uh, you have you will obviously not have twenty four hours of usage. You'll probably have fifteen twenty minutes or thirty minutes depending on how long that batch process takes, and you kill it afterwards. And if if you want to go a step ahead, you can go to the container world where you use something like a Fargate or something, and and you deploy it across containers. The options are there. Even with even with plain vanilla EC2, the options exist for you to actually run it on demand just at that moment, and that's it. Yeah, and let's say we haven't even talked about AWS Batch, which is a managed service, which instead of you um, 
you know, in the scenario Harsha was describing, right, where you, you're, you're still maintaining the scheduler, maybe you have a small one, and then it, it uses fleet or other constructs to spin up compute as needed, but batch takes that up another layer of abstraction where, where it manages that, that workflow and handles the, the spinning up and tearing down of compute um, to optimize your cost. So yeah, I would, I, I would actually strongly say batch is a very uh, cloud-friendly workload pattern um, yeah. You know, so if you have that, because it, it tends to have a lot of uh, spikes and inefficiency. Yeah, have a service AWS back. yeah, right. That's what I mentioned. So, yeah. I think uh, we have time for one more. One more. Oh, well, Bert says I only have one. Someone's been very patient. Is uh, so. Do you see any side effects of doing API by API migrations? Like, uh, let's say we have a 200 APIs, so we can break like 10 APIs move, then mm -hmm. another 10, and that one will become a hybrid approach where something goes on AWS on a cl cloud, something resides on premises, but database still stays on. So we do not have a issues like a read-write issues. It's a still mm -hmm. single database. Do you see any side impacts or uh, drawbacks? So, is it, so your question was any, any side effects or drawbacks? In migration strategy where we take API by APIs. Yeah. Yeah, so I think if you, you can obviously have the functionality drill down on the same relational database if you so wish. I think the problem there is, is that you're still constrained by the fact that relational databases may not necessarily be the right fit for the job. You could, and we've got some patterns where we've looked at that in the past where they're connecting back. Um, we've shown it that you can migrate the data across because you then have more freedom. Ultimately, you don't want to tie yourself to, you, know, you, know, you don't want to pull the code out of the original monolith and put it into a lambda. All right, and then have it connect back. You want to effectively you want to rewrite from scratch. Is what we're trying. Is tr trying to stay here because it's probably you know most monoliths I've worked with have been 10, 15 years old. That code that code is no longer contemporary in the first instance. Uh, and as Harsha pointed out in the presentation, you probably don't you haven't retained the original developer who wrote that in the first instance. So they've probably gone through their mindset at that point in time, which is you know in technology times is ancient at that point in time. Um, but you can do it, and there's flexibility there. We showed it with the migration because we felt that, that was actually a good, responsible pattern to adopt. Um, but there's nothing stopping you in any shape or form. Yeah. I think the litmus test is, you know, is it, um, c can that team still move independently at the pace you want them to move in? Uh, otherwise, you, m you might be creating another monolith with a modern stack. Right, which is it could happen, right? It's like if if you so that informs you know how many you, you group. So that's why we had those metrics up, right? About agility and it's like figure out where I am, where I want to be. But um, the, the Vanguard in their session, which we've plugged several times, also talked about uh, team size and how to get to the optimal team size. And you know we, we have some wisdom ab about that that works in our culture here at Amazon.com. But you know a team that's sort of big enough. To, to get things done, but small enough to, to go pretty quickly. But if, if that, that APIs that are in that bounded context starts to grow and you start thinking, oh, this might be just another mini monolith um, and we're still not able to do releases very frequently, that, that'll be kind of a, a red flag that I might need to do some mitosis again and, and carve some of those APIs out. So I don't, I don't know if that helps, but yep. And just, yeah, just to add to that API, I mean, I would look at it functionality or the business problem that the API is trying to solve rather than just blindly picking 10 APIs, right? So you would, you would obviously, it's not about how many APIs, it's about how did you decide about which API did you pick? I think that's more important. Once you have that in mind, you can just rewrite the entire piece, make sure that you have the least amount of dependency back to the monolith, and you just have an independent working entity, and that's it. Cool, all right, well, Bert said that was our last one, so. We're around, uh, it's the last session of the day, so uh, if you still have more questions you didn't get to ask, uh, we'll be here for a bit. Thank you. Yep.